wonderful to work with professionals. Good morning, everyone. And may you have a blessed and happy Lord's Day today. Uh, shall we join together silently, praying that God would prepare our hearts and this congregation for worship, which is our highest and greatest duty um, and privilege. Let us pray. Almighty God, we offer prayers of, of concern and also praise for the presence of your church throughout the world. And we know that we are but one part of it. So may we pray for all the rest that along with us uh, they may Glorify your name as they're assembled wherever they're assembled. May you comfort us with the gospel's truth this morning. And may Jesus Christ be evident in the sacrament we celebrate by faith. And we pray in his name and for his glory. Amen. Please stand. Grace to you and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Our call to worship today is John 4:24. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Number 119, I sing the almighty power of God is our opening hymn. Number 119. heavens and earth, we praise your glorious majesty as we have gathered here. It is you and your name, not ours, that we would long others to know, and it is your name we praise. Your wisdom is seen in everything you do, your grace and truth you have revealed in Jesus Christ, your Son, your power, your presence are graciously given by the Holy Spirit to us. And for that reason, 
We adore your holy name, which is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the Blessed Trinity, forever and ever. Amen. Now let's be seated, everyone. <clears throat> In your bulletin, you'll find a listing of the Ten Commandments and some responsive readings there. Um, All right, and the leader part is mine, and I will be doing that with the non-bold print, and just answer with the bold immediately after it. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. All the hands of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image to bow down and worship them. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of human hands. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Honor your father and your mother. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet anything that is your neighbor's. I turn in your hymnals now to hymn number 489. 489, like as the publican I stand, will be our confession. And please just remain uh, seated as we sing that. <clears throat> confessed our sins and heard the Lord's law, let us now stand. And as you do, listen to these words from 1 John 1, verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive our sins and cleanse us 
from all unrighteousness. Let us profess our faith now using the words of the Nicene Creed found on page 846 in your hymnal. And brothers and sisters, let us read together. We believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men, our salvation, came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, and he up and sits. And he shall come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And we believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Having taught the Romans all of the uh, mystery of salvation and the glory of salvation uh, that by grace in the Lord Jesus Christ during the first 11 chapters of Romans he begins to apply that truth to the subject of offering sacrifices to God the sacrifices of our very lives which he has paid the price for here are the words therefore I urge you brethren by the mercies of God to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Number 731 is a response to doxology. Malachi, my messenger, that means. Uh, Malachi chapter 1, verse 11, as our introduction to our intercessory prayer today. From the rising of the sun, even to its setting, my name will be great among the nations. And in every place, incense is going to be offered to my name, and a grain offering that is pure. For my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. Shall we pray? Oh, Father, God, eternal and everlasting one, from the rising of the sun to the going down of the same, your name is great among all the nations. To you, oh, Lord God, we, we come to you and we, we offer the incense of praise, the offering of thanksgiving, 
as we have gathered here. We pray that you would, um, by your Holy Spirit, teach and clarify, maybe in a new way, the meaning of the Lord's table that we are going to observe later by your providence. May we see with the eyes, the eyes of faith that show the perfect glory of Christ. Mighty God, you are Lord of your people in every land. You, we, we pray uh, along with our um, Committee on Foreign Missions for the church in Haiti and in Asia, uh, in Uruguay and in Uganda. We pray for, for new laborers to be recruited and, and put on the field soon and for uh, opportunities to open up and travel as well and safety for those serving. Oh, Father, your name is blessed on every shore, and from the rising of the sun to its setting, we pray for the other pastors in our community. Wherever we happen to live, oh Lord, we know that your people are there. Forgive us the sin of Elijah to think that we are alone, that you, you have not your people in every place. And we, oh Lord, pray for them. We pray for those who are your people in places where they're persecuted. We pray for those people who are your people who are suffering now because of deprivation or um, because of a lack of resources. We pray for those who labor in the churches in our community and we ask that you would strengthen them as they minister and by your spirit uh, give them increase. You are the commander of the host of heaven, O Lord. And from the rising of the sun to its setting on earth, your name is great. Your name is proclaimed constantly in heaven. Lord, we long to join that chorus. We thank you for the glimpse of it we have by your grace and your, your kind provision to gather on the Lord's day to do that. May the taste be sweet. You are the creator of all the people in the earth. And so we pray to you for the peoples that are living in misery right now. For lands where there's great poverty. For our land where there is muddy water. Give us clarity, O oh Lord. Show us the truth. We have been too long distracted. Where there is oppression in the world, O oh Lord, and tyranny, uh, we pray that you would put it down. Father, whose name is blessed on every shore, in every nation, in every place on earth, Lord of all the earth, and, and, and a most pure God who has purer eyes than even to behold evil, we pray for our land, knowing that we share in its evils as citizens here, we also, O oh Lord, thank you for the good. And we pray in, in, in the days and months and years ahead that we would remember that it is you who is king and you alone. And so we pray also for those who serve under your lordship. For our president, Mr. Trump, we pray for him. We pray for the judges of our courts. We pray for our governor here in Wisconsin, Mr. Evers, and we pray for all the governors of our states. They're facing challenges. Lord, we ask your glory to be done. We pray for our senators, Mr. Johnson and Ms. Baldwin, and we pray for the members of the Senate from other states. Lord, there are, there is a need for understanding among each other. May they Seek that first. Likewise, for our U.S. representatives, Mr. Style, Mr. Poken, Mr. Kine, Ms. Moore, Mr. Sensenbrenner, Mr. Grothman, Mr. Tiffany, and Mr. Gallagher. We pray for those who are members from other states of the House of Representatives as well, and we pray, O oh Lord, that you would cause understanding and kindness 
Let the Christians in both of these bodies, O Lord, lead the way in representing it. Grant that they who lead our land and people would do so in justice and equity that reflects your glory and not their own will. O God, we know that your glory is from the rising of the sun to its setting. And so, commander of the host of heaven, we pray for those who are having special need, undergoing medical situations. We, there are many. Lord, we, we pray for a wisdom and that you would uh, protect the hearts of your people that they might call upon you and give you glory in the chastisement of these things. Grant deliverance from suffering and, and ease the pain of those who do suffer. Oh Lord, we pray that you would mend relationships that have been broken and that you would strengthen our faith so that we might have a strong hope for the future as well. And so to you, O oh Father, God eternal and everlasting, we present these prayers and supplications and confessions and praises in the name of and trusting only in the merit of and sacrifice of Christ, Jesus, your Son, through whom, with whom, and in whom we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Uh, we're, we're going to be reading from uh, John chapter 15. That's our first scripture reading this morning. John chapter 15, verse 26 through 16, through, uh, 16 verse 15, uh, found on page 902 of the Pew Bible there. <clears throat> When the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, that is, the Spirit of truth, <clears throat> who proceeds from the Father, he will testify about me. And you will testify also, because you have been with me from the beginning. These things I have spoken to you so that you may be kept from stumbling. They will make you outcasts from the synagogue. But an hour is coming for everyone who kills you to think that he is offering a service to God. These things they will do because they have not known the Father or me. But these things I have spoken to you <clears throat> so that when their hour comes, you may re <clears throat> Excuse me. The water worked but too well. Okay. <clears throat> These things they will do because they have not known the Father or me. But these things I have spoken to you, so that when their hour comes, you may remember that I told you of them. These things I did not say to you at the beginning, because I was with you. But now I am going to him who sent me. And none of you asks me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. But I tell you, the truth it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And he, when he comes, will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you no longer see me. Concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world has been judged. I have many more things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak of his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will disclose to you what is to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of mine and will disclose it to you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore, I said that he takes of mine and will disclose it to you. And now from the Old Testament, our readings in Isaiah continue at chapter 32. 
This morning we'll read the whole chapter. That's on page 592. <clears throat> Behold, a king will, raise, will reign righteously, and princes will rule justly. Each will be like a refuge from the wind and a shelter from the storm, like streams of water in a dry country, like the shade of a huge rock in a parched land. Then the eyes of those who will see will not be blinded, and the ears of those who hear will listen. The mind of the hasty will discern the truth, and the tongue of the stammerers will hasten to speak clearly. No longer will the fool be called noble, or the rogue be spoken of as generous. For a fool speaks nonsense, and his heart inclines toward wickedness to practice ungodliness and to speak error against the Lord, to keep the hungry person unsatisfied and to withhold drink from the thirsty. As for the rogue, his, his weapons are evil. He devises wicked schemes to destroy the afflicted with slander, even though the needy one speaks what is right. But the noble man devises noble plans, and by noble plans he stands. Rise up, you women who are at ease, and hear my voice. Give ear to my word, you complacent daughters. Within a year and a few days, you will be troubled, O complacent daughters. For the vintage is ended, and the fruit gathering will not come. Tremble, you women who are at ease. Be troubled, you complacent daughters. Strip, undress, and put sackcloth on your waist. Beat your breasts for the pleasant fields for the fruitful vine, for the land of my people in which thorns and briars shall come up, yea, for all the joyful houses and for the jubilant city. Because the palace has been abandoned, the populated city forsaken, hill and watchtower have become caves forever, a delight for wild donkeys, a pasture for flocks. Until the spirit is poured out upon us from on high, and the wilderness becomes a fertile field, and the fertile field is considered as a forest, then justice will dwell in the wilderness, and righteousness will abide in the fertile field. And the work of righteousness will be peace, and the service of righteousness, quietness and confidence forever. Then my people will live in a peaceful habitation, and in secure dwellings, and in undisturbed resting places. And it will hail when the forest comes down, and the city will be utterly laid low. How blessed will you be, you who sow beside all waters, who let out freely the ox and the donkey. Let us pray. O Lord, God of our Father, God of our Lord Jesus Christ, Father of glory, we pray that you would give to us a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of the one true God. We pray that you would open <clears throat> and enlighten the eyes of our hearts so that we will know what is the hope of your calling? What are the riches of the glory of the inheritance in Christ in the saints? In his name we pray. Amen. It kind of goes with the territory that I suppose I wouldn't be bragging if I said I'm reasonably sure that I have been involved in the conduct and planning of funerals more than most of you. I don't know how many, but it's a lot. Now, I maybe haven't attended as many as you have. Usually I'm the officiate, the minister, you know. Occasionally, though, uh, I attend as a mourner or a someone who celebrates the homegoing of a brother or sister in Christ. 
I had that experience recently, uh, not the going home of a brother and sister, but uh, a memorial service for someone who was an acquaintance, not a believer, uh, not in a church, no reason to find any comfort in this death. Um, in fact, several eulogies were delivered um, with the aim of remembering and celebrating the life of this person and, and also to get comfort. I listened, you know, guarding my heart from judgmentalism because I always do that whenever somebody else is talking. And as the speakers spoke, every one of them spoke, you know, and, and, and they attempted to do what is utterly impossible. The remembrances, they were fine with that. I think they did a good job. They had a lot of stories about the person. But they tried to do something that they simply had no ability and can't be done. Comfort. That was where they fell. See, God was not a prominent name spoken at this uh, service. Um, in fact, uh, each speaker tried to bring comfort, but did it with as little direct reference to the power of God, the one thing everybody needed to know about, to sustain and bless us. We need God. God, God is not a nice to have in your life thing, you know. We need Him. It, it's on the can't live without list. It, 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 it has to be that daily, weekly, hourly, we are thinking about our relationship to God in Christ, that we are led along to understand where we need to repent and change. If we ignore Him or neglect His guidance, if we, if we never ask, if we never look in His Word to make a decision, we never pray about what we're thinking about, if we live guidance-free, then we're living as if God doesn't exist at all. And that's, that's a horrible place to be. Not only that, when we withhold the protection and counsel of God through His Word and through prayer and, and uh, through the saints, we place ourselves totally naked and without help right in the path of all of life's evil. And we have no protection. What we must do is be about the task of daily listening and looking. When God is at the center of our thinking and He's the first place we go, when He's the center of our believing, then we start to learn of hope and with the hope of God that He gives us, Whatever goes on tomorrow can be faced by us because God is the one that is Lord of it. So to what do we listen? Toward what do we look? Well, you know, it's a good thing. It's a simple answer. God has spoken to us, hasn't he? He's promised lots of things. He's commanded things to us. Um, a couple of them, I'll give you an example, that are just um, favorites. Uh, for us. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare and not for calamity. To give you a future and a hope. That's in there. That's a good one. I will never leave you or forsake you. If I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. Have I not commanded you, Joshua 1.9, be strong and courageous, do not be discouraged, do not be, ter do not be terrified, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Job 36, he does not withdraw his eyes from the righteous. Genesis 12, I will bless those who bless you and I will curse those who curse you. 
in just these and the vast and varied promises and other things God has said for us to be encouraged by, promises he has made to us, the clear message that anyone who reads the Bible could get is that we serve a God who loves us. He wants to show us who he is. And with that one fact alone, that God loves his children, that one fact, armed with it alone, all the snags of this life and this world, in all things we are overly, overwhelmingly conquerors through him who loved us. Our world is not really our world, is it? Thought of rightly as God's children, this place is just a pretty nice wayside while we wait for heaven and labor for the kingdom in this world so that we may glorify our God who is in heaven. We are on the way to somewhere else. Jesus said he's preparing a place for us He's going to come and get us if we're here when he arrives. Otherwise, he'll take us home if we are his. That puts us at a great disadvantage when the worldly-minded people of the world make plans which do not include God or any notion of that direction of thinking. And they rarely do include that. If we indicate or say something that we ought to consider God's guidance in these things, like defining certain social structures, like families and marriages. We are likely to be ignored at the easiest and to be targeted at the worst. You know, we just don't operate on the same radio band as the world does. I'm not even thinking that we have a same radio. I don't think it was any different in Isaiah's day. Before the king died, God sent Isaiah to tell that king, Ahaz, Judah, the kingdom, that Assyria is no problem, that God is going to take care of Assyria's threat. The Assyrians, meanwhile, a godless nation, went about their plundering and their threatening and their violence. So the, the, the really poor king Ahaz dies, a kind of faithless king dies, and his faithful son Hezekiah assumes the throne. And he had seen the Assyrians actually attack and threaten Jerusalem. And he, he offered, they're at the gate now, and he offers tribute to them if they would not take and destroy Jerusalem. He, he strips all the riches out of the temple to do it. We read about that in 2 Kings 18. But what Hezekiah offers is not enough. And you can also read about that too. In fact, we'll be doing that in about three chapters here. We're not told exactly when it was, but Hezekiah was a younger man when he became the king, and he probably ruled along with his father uh, at, the, at the same time. We don't know when exactly, but at some point, his advisors, that is Hezekiah's advisors, and, and, the, and the people, the, the, the people that, that, that run the various ministries of the government, decided it would be a good idea to go and pay Egypt to be a friend to Israel should Judah be attacked by Assyria. This seemed perfectly reasonable to anyone who was a practical politician. When you look at the way that the forces are arrayed on the ground, the only country who had any kind of strength, even close to the ability to resist Assyria, was Egypt, and so why not join up with them? Right? Makes sense. Well, we've been over this a little bit, but I think I should repeat it. Judah had long before received a command from God, along with all God's people, that they were never to turn for Egypt for help, ever. It was the great redemptive act of God for his own people to redeem them and bring them out of slavery in Egypt. 
They were barred from going back. You do not return to your vomit, folks. In Exodus 13, Deuteronomy 17, we can see that. Last week we saw in chapter 31 how in 700 B.C. things were getting awfully difficult. They saw, the advisors, and probably Hezekiah saw, Assyria as a threat. They saw Egypt as a source of help. Both of those things are utterly wrong, and they acted on them without consulting God. Because had they consulted God, they would have found out, in the law it says, you do not go back to Egypt for help. Okay, well, we've got to find another way then. I've already told you, Assyria is no problem. So are you going to believe God's word or not, leaders of the nation? They had to make some decisions, and they made all the wrong ones. Then, as Isaiah said, horrible decisions. They didn't have all the facts. Because Assyria wasn't a threat. And Egypt, God said, was not even an option. It was barred for them. Why are those facts? Egypt, Assyria had a huge army, and Egypt had a lot of resources as well. It was a fact because God had said it. God has said Assyria is not a threat, so is Assyria a threat? No. Though God had told them all through the history of their following him that he, that he loved them and kept forgiving them and kept caring for them and kept redeeming them, their knowledge of that love did not extend to the affairs of state or maybe even their private lives. It seems that their knowledge of God was only kind of that uh, theoretical thing. where It's not really threatening knowledge. You know, it doesn't really have anything to do with my daily life. I can believe that. I can put in God we trust on the money. I don't have to actually do anything about that phrase, right? Well, eh, go ahead and put it on there then. My life doesn't have to change, does it? It seems this knowledge they had was incomplete because we know things on two depths okay we know things in two ways not ways but we know things on two depths one is a shallow knowledge uh, we attain knowledge by studying in books or we reading and we know facts about things and we have head knowledge of something and it's conceptual that's one way we know things or one depth of our knowledge we also enter in and the world might even disagree with us, uh, spiritual people, on this. We also enter into things, an understanding of things, with the sense of the heart, too. We believe, not with our mind, but with our heart. The mind and the will and the motions work together. It, it's like the difference between reading the operating manual of your car, sitting on your lazy boy in your living room and saying, I know how to drive, and actually driving. See, God has made us to know him in these two ways. One way is not better or worse than the other. It's just that there's two ways. Thoughts and belief work together. Had the leaders of Judah been operating by faith, they would have seen God's promises as facts, like I said Hey, we have it here in the word, spoken by the prophet as well. Well, we don't need to spend money on that. There's going to be no problem with Assyria. It is the same for us. The gospel truth of the incarnate Son of God living a perfect sinless life on this earth, voluntarily, Terribly submitting to the suffering and death of the cross for the sake of all who are his, dying this horrible death, but rising again on the third day to new life. One depth is the fact of everything I just said. It's a mass of theoretical assertions. But when it is believed in the heart, when it is trusted in, as well as known in the mind, then the comforts 
in God's word, the gospel of salvation, reach our whole way of knowing, and that God uses to change us and sanctify us. Isaiah 32 is the antidote to lack of spiritual mindedness. The people had, and it's the antidote to spiritual mindedness, uh, to anti-spiritual mindedness as well for everyone. This chapter is Isaiah's guidance through a spiritual kind of wisdom of the kind that changes hearts. We want to achieve today both depths of the knowledge of what the Lord is promising to do for his people in the midst of their spiritual deadness and apathy and rebellion. And to bring them to the promise of true blessedness. Blessedness. I, I'm going to uh, um, short story about what happened. Uh, we were having Heidi and I were having dinner at uh, um, a family's. I didn't get permission, so I won't tell you where I was. Um, and, uh, one of the children in the in the family at the dinner table um, asked me, on a scale of one to ten, are you happy? Uh, this is not really normal dinner conversation, but he asked me that. And I said, hmm. And then I began to do my pastor thing, and I was teaching him that happy is maybe not what we always think it is. We think happy is I'm getting everything I need, I have what I want, I, I, I'm, I'm upwardly mobile, you know, etc. All the bills are paid. Blessedness is a word we use which the New Testament does often translate happiness. The Old Testament uses two words for it, one happiness and the other like benediction or a pronouncing of a blessing. There's overlap in the meaning, but blessedness, if you look at it, is a state of happiness. When we speak of it in biblical terms, it's a state of happiness then in having all you need from God and nothing else. Wanting nothing else but what God gives you. It is satisfaction in Him alone and His grace alone. Satisfaction in His work alone. <clears throat> this state of happiness is precisely what God is promising to effect and uh, achieve through His solitary work as he tells of it to the people through Isaiah, and it reveals four conditions of this blessedness that God will affect. Four conditions of true blessedness. The first is in verses 1 through 8. We're finally going to have the right guy in office. We're finally going to have a righteous ruler. And we're finally going to have righteous policies and righteous results of that government. He's already in office. Our king is totally unlike anything the world knows or thinks about when it thinks about what rulers are, ought to be like. Our world shows us leaders, and I can safely say that every single one of them is a sinner, and some of them are corrupt, some of them self-exalt themselves, and some of them lie. Some of them don't lie, but they spin things. Some of them are good folks, too. They, 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 they tell the truth, and they do good things. They... But our king is altogether flawlessly righteous. Our Messiah, Jesus, comes to rule in righteousness, and that is, that is the anchor that stops the drift of a people is the understanding of righteousness coming from Christ and no one else. That's the cornerstone which is the safe refuge from the oppression of the world. Unlike the rulers that the, that the Jews had there in Judah, um, the Messiah Jesus comes not to feather his nest, to live in the big house, he didn't come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. There's also some great accomplishments here that 
are connected with Isaiah himself, these righteous results. Isaiah call his call in chapter 6. You remember the, the, very, um, the very dramatic way that Isaiah was called with the taking up to the, uh, the temple in heaven and the, 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 the temple filling with smoke and the angels with the holy, holy, holy. What you don't often remember, and many don't, is that the, the call that God gave him was to go and tell this people... Keep on listening, but don't perceive. Keep on looking, but do not understand. Rend, uh, rend the heart, render the hearts of the people insensitive, their ears dull and their eyes dim. That was Isaiah's mission. Prophets get dirty work sometimes. Here in chapter 32, we read this. There's going to be a whole new people when the Messiah reigns. The eyes of those who see will not be blinded. The ears of those who hear will listen. The mind of the hasty will discern the truth. The tongue of the stammerers will hasten to speak clearly. The Messiah's rule will remove the deafness and blindness and bring clarity of spiritual things. That's why we prayed after we read the scripture that the eyes of our hearts would be enlightened. That we would see and behold the hope and the riches and power that we have in Christ that is our inheritance. How does this come about? It comes about through the gospel. In accordance with the working of his strength which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. The righteous king is going to reign. And no longer... Will evil things be called good and good things be called evil? Isaiah 5, the prophet pronounced one of the judgments against Judah itself was that they had turned around morality. They had turned around truth. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil. They substitute darkness for light and vice versa. They substitute bitter for sweet and vice versa. They lie. New righteousness comes, though, in the reign of our King Jesus. New champions emerge among his people, and they will be seen to be noble and generous, exemplary even. And the fools and rogues who plan and speak against the Lord, who, who deprive the needy, They'll be seen for what they are. But this is just all effects of the one thing. And the one thing you have to grab onto, which is the righteous rule of Christ among his people and in the whole world. Who is the noble man there in verse 8 who devises noble plans and by noble plans he stands? Who is that? Well, there's only one righteous man. It is Jesus Christ. It is not man's nobility that accomplishes any of this. It is Christ's nobility that dignifies us, Christ's righteousness that saves us. The plans of men will fail, have failed, and indeed can be observed to be failing. Why? Because they're not righteous plans. We don't have a righteous king ruling. At best, maybe we get half of it right. Maybe not even that. What had Judah done? I mean, they, they had more access. They had a prophet who was actually preaching. They had more resources than we, uh, in some cases. They had turned to Egypt and begged and sucked up to Egypt and paid them lots of money to be their friend. By the way, if you have to pay somebody to be your friend, probably not your friend. Okay. And they had bowed to the throne of failed human power. I don't have an application of the next two statements to anything particular that is going on right now. What it is, is the way out of our problems is not more plans, but more righteousness. The way out is Christ. Bowing at the throne of King Jesus alone, that's what being noble, righteous is. And dignified is. So first of all, a righteous ruler, righteous results. Uh, secondly, rousing from complacency and comfort. 
Isaiah, Isaiah isn't really picking on the women in these verses, 9 through 14. Um, he singles them out because he's able to observe them. Um, and it's harvest time. And the houses have parties in them. The markets are full of fruit. And they're partying when they should be mourning. Because next year, it's all going to go away. There will be no crop next year. There will be no, no anything. Their blissful ignorance is laid at their feet, and it's less than a year ago, and less than a year from now, and the harvest will fail. It will be uh, under oppression from a foreign power. They were living in the false security of their own strength, taking their happiness from what they had materially instead of what they had spiritually. The success of the harvest is a, is a wonderful thing to have. But what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? Isaiah singles the women out, not because they're women, um, but because they're characteristic as a group of the whole nation of Judah that everybody was acting like them. Their, the word is complacent. They were being complacent, and the idea here is an unworthy or unjustified confidence. Reliance upon wrong things. The men were at the royal court in Judah, and they're agonizing about what to do with Assyria, which they don't need to do, but they're doing it. A situation God has already promised to take care of. The women can't see beyond the marketplace and their shopping baskets. There's nothing to worry about. We got dates. You know, we got all the food we need. They represent the kind of happiness that is lethal to a spiritual people. Earthly contentment with no longings for God. It comes down to this. The Messiah's kingdom is no place for someone who will not examine their faults immediately because they are not complacent. Do you think that you are good enough, righteous enough, loving enough, merciful enough right now that you don't need to change? I'll change. I know I need to work on that, but I'll work on it tomorrow. Ah, see, you might not have tomorrow, and I think that the more complacent a person is the less likely they are to respond to correction. So how can we keep ourselves out of complacency, this death of complacency? Like most of the hard questions that have to do with, here's the way you're living, and here's the way God says you should live, um, the answer is the gospel to that question. The answer is not another plan, not another 12 and a half step program, not another, it is the gospel. And you know the thing is about the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, you can come to that truth that, that he has saved you by grace, that he will, he will grant you faith and repentance, pray to him and ask that he would, that it would be his will to save you? The gospel and God will take you as you are. But the gospel does not allow you to stay that way if you truly receive it. Yes, you can come to this, to, to, to Christ as a wretched wreck of a sinner, and boy, most of us, I can tell you we are. I would even say all of us. But no one who in truth comes to Christ can remain as long as they do truly come. Why? Because God knows what you need to be like. What you think about how you ought to be is not the guiding star for God's work in your life to make you Christ-like. He tells us 
When it comes to our own lives, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and He will lift you up. I think that's really good advice. That's not advice. It's James 4.10. What is this humble thing, though? Well, it's not complacency, that's for sure. It's not being comforted and settled in not changing. Complacency is insisting that everything's okay when it's not. Peace, peace, but there is no peace, Ezekiel says. It's funny that the command to humble yourselves in James lies in the domain of a transaction where we come face to face with our real lack of righteousness and faith. It is good, it is a good command in James 4.10, but the, the road to humility, James 4.9, is paved, and this is a warning, with some unpleasant things. What, is, what does James 4.9 say? Before you humble yourselves, be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your so-called joy to gloom. And so Isaiah says to the women who should be more concerned about their righteousness, about their devotion to God, about their obedience to his word, about the state of their soul, mourn over the fields, he says. You should be mourning. You should be trembling. You should be troubled. You should be wearing sackcloth because the curse of sin is going to come upon Israel. Verse 13. The land of my people which, in which thorns and briars have come up. You recall anybody talking in Genesis 3.18 that something was going to come up as thorns and briars and this was a curse because they had sinned? Well, this is to get us to perk up and ask and to listen and to look to the Lord for grace and to listen to His Word and be ready to be found complacent and repent of that complacency. So we see a righteous ruler with righteous results, a rousing from complacency and comfort, and then a renewal by the Holy Spirit in 15 through 18. Um, if you look back at verses 1 and 2, they don't... I've been talking about the Messiah King, and I've been saying that. Um, I did not feel the need to show that and why that was. But if you look closely, there's no outright statement that this King is Jesus. But no one else is righteous. There is no one righteous but Christ. And so there can be no righteous King but Christ. You get the idea, though, that the king is a king ruling a nation. It was a, a, a man. But he's also divine. If you look at the way that it's, he's presented there, being righteous is a divine thing. It's not a human thing. Righteousness and justice result from his rule, and things in the world change because he's king but not before the calamities of verses 9 through 14 occur. What verse 15 emphasizes is the spiritual nature of God. That God is a spirit, infinite, eternal, and changeable, and His being, wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness, and truth. And the chapter comes to a close here in chapter 32. It comes to a close with the promise of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit here in verse 15. This produces promised results in and through the people. The wilderness becomes a fertile field. Righteousness and justice and peace are the effects of the Messiah's reign. It's the same as the effects of the Holy Spirit's outpouring by the grace of God. So all of this is all of one thing, isn't it? The Messiah reigns by the power of the Holy Spirit and the Spirit of God is making the completeness of all of God's promises. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the Trinity, the one God who is God, works 
in everything, all three persons. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit is perhaps the most significant act of God toward human society since creation itself. I'm not saying that the cross and the resurrection were not significant. I'm saying that was not toward the society. That was for God's elect people. It is God's renewing of his people that is going to be the most important thing in changing the world. He will, he will bring the world to understand the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ through the people he has set aside. You can see the importance of having to do that. Complacent, unspiritual people is what we generally are without grace and without the re regeneration of the Holy Spirit. Divine intervention is what we need in our life. We need a miracle to change us because we are really powerless to change ourselves. Isaiah doesn't come to the people as a prophet to help them identify the ways which they have not attained self-actualization according to their belief in themselves. That is not the prophet's mission. He didn't come to identify their problems and solve them. He didn't come to propose new economic reforms or military policies. The time for all of the change that they could make is past by the time Isaiah gets there. He wasn't even given a mission to change anyone. The world needed to be changed not by Isaiah, not by the king, but, and not by the people of Judah, but by God himself. And that is what he says here in, verse, in chapter 32. You do not need an adjustment. You need a total renewal of your whole life. You are dead in your trespasses and sins. You need resurrection to new life. And it is by the Spirit of God that he will affect that. And not by dribs and drabs, and not by drops here and, and something there, but by... A diluvian cleanse, a flood of the Holy Spirit, a complete immersion of the Holy Spirit. He will pour out his life-giving spirit to remake what is broken by an outpouring that washes away all the complacency and leaves us truly seeing our souls with the sin that they have in clarity. And that will lead us to conviction of sin. And that will lead us by God's grace to confess and believe. He has been keeping this promise to gather people to himself by the Holy Spirit's outpouring for 2,000 years. Sometimes he does it in an overwhelming multitude. Sometimes he does it in a Sometimes he withholds that blessing. He's God, his business. He began at Pentecost, though, and it is still going on. Romans 5, and not only this, but we also exult in our tribulations. Exult in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance. The change is not a thing that happens in one day. Paul is saying that, look, change happens this way. Tribulation brings perseverance. The definition of perseverance is it takes time. Perseverance brings on proven character. Proven character brings on hope. And hope does not disappoint because the hope is not based on things that change. Hope is based on the love of God which has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Isaiah 32 teaches us that the real power of God's people is the Lordship of Christ and the outpouring of His Spirit. It's just as important that this statement I made be understood with the following condition. Not only are the Lordship of Christ and the outpouring of the Spirit the power that God has given His people, 
Nothing else is our power but that. So we see a righteous ruler, righteous results, rousing from complacency and comfort as a blessing and being renewed by the Holy Spirit as a blessing. Also, another mark of blessing is the reality is redefined God's way. This is a short and this is the conclusion point of this uh, message uh, because it is a little obscure in language, but it's easy to understand. Once you understand, we're left with verses 19 and 20, which seem to be mm, a little bit shaded, but actually they're the key to seeing the urgency to call, the call to believe in the gospel. It sets before us glory or judgment. Verse 19 says, there's going to be a time when the forests are going to fall. And there's going to be a time when the city will be laid low. So all of the things you're familiar with, the two uh, great parts of the world, the city and the country, are all going to be laid low. There will be a fall of both forest and city. There's another truth that goes with that, and there is also, in verse 20, there is peace in a new world. Look what verse 20 says. How blessed, what does that mean? Happy, uh, satisfied, fully supplied with all things you need. How blessed will you be, you who sow beside all waters, who let out freely the ox and the donkey. There is a new reality that God is going to transform through judgment. Both judgment and glory are in the future. So now is the time, today is the day to put off all complacency and get real about the nature of your sin. And rejoice in the grace of God who, when any sinner repents, receives him as he did the prodigal son. Judgment or glory? When all is said and done, what needs to happen in each and every one of us is a change of heart. How does that happen? Well, God has made the gospel the way into your heart. It is his appointed means of changing. The truth that God, the truth is that God who is spirit, humbled himself to become flesh, to die on a cross of shame for sinners who put him there. The all-powerful God became weak because of his love for you. He became foolish for you at the cross. We started out talking at the beginning. We said that there are two depths of knowledge. The gospel is not just an attractive collection of concepts that seem to work so that you can live a better life. The gospel is about the heart believing in the God who saves. It's turning to him, even now. Listening to him every minute. Trusting him when it's hard to do it. Because he promises to save you. In fact, really, actually, and completely, isn't it the day to do that? Isn't it the day to turn to him and to listen to him? Let us pray. <clears throat> oh Lord, our God, who when speaks the whole universe shakes. 
Give us ears to hear, O God. Give us eyes to see. We ask for your filling of your Holy Spirit. We ask for, Lord, we ask for you to lay open our hearts that we may be found refreshed by the word and the sacrament this morning. May there not be a hurtful way in us. May we be quick to repent. May we be not complacent, not spiritually lazy. May we look at our faults as a beam and the faults of others as a speck. Amen.